that was with with Panamonium. It was, I was that was a magical time actually. But especially the early demo stuff because we were doing everything that Edge of Sanity didn't. Yeah, it was like right. a style thing. Let's tune down as deep as the guitar <laughs> strings allow. Let's have tons <laughs> of keyboards. Let's have like a fucking coffee machine vocals like, <laughs> and just blast beats and doom, you know, and just do weird shit yeah because at sanity was then very heavily guarded by me and my rules no you cannot do this you know right. but with pandemonium we could just do weird weirdest stuff yeah sound like other bands like this is a bold thrower <laughs> rip off i would never allow for anything to, to enter edge of sanity that was clearly another band's style you know yeah because i want us to be our own you know right well kind of getting back to edge of sanity then so you know we move beyond kind of um the nothing record and and obviously that brought some praise to the band i'm sure and when we get to unorthodox it looks like you were still going to montezuma to record um but when i was talking so uh, reaper had mentioned we had reached out to fans and at, you know have them ask questions and we got insane amount of response to that um which is That's which cool. is cool yeah um but to get them all in i, I don't know if it's going to happen so again we might might have the continuation of this interview one day 40 but, minutes <laughs> in we're not going to get them all in <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but uh something that matt actually matt from sentient horror brought up to me who you know obviously from from working with him for the past couple Absolutely. years it's a great guy. guy yeah yeah great guy great band right um and obviously an ode an ode to you in, in more ways than one but uh, he had mentioned that you you had said something about you, with unorthodox you had kind of done everything you wanted to do in death metal uh, by that time and I thought that was kind of an interesting thing and I don't know if I'm, I'm quoting it right I don't know if he's co- quoting it right but something along those lines so is that kind of a true statement and with that said obviously things really did start changing uh, after that album so it doesn't make sense uh, timeline wise but can you, I guess maybe. Uh, open up about that a little bit and kind of absolutely explain. he is spot on and i think i was drunk out of my fucking brain in new york when i told him this <laughs> because we met there when, when we were on holiday yeah i remember and uh <laughs> that was good times but yeah i remember that specific moment and it's it's one of those i'm sure you guys have had it too maybe not so much in, in, in this musical way but you know i just was on the train home from finishing the mix, I just listened to it in my cassette Walkman. And at the end of when all is said, when it just faded out, I just felt this weird, strange sensation in my stomach, like something's wrong, something's not right, you know, like, oh, what the fuck I do now then? That, that's like, that's it. What's left to do? I put all this, from the moment I discovered that kind of genre, that long fucking ride, which was not so long in, in time, but for me, you know, the teenage years, they, they seem to last longer somehow. Yeah. So from, from me first getting into a little bit heavier stuff than, than maybe hard rock to doing that kind of death metal thing and then blow it out of proportion, bringing on cellos, acoustic guitars, clean singing, doom ballads with piano. <laughs> and I just like, what now then? Yeah, where, where Fuck, you go? <laughs> we signed a lifetime deal, you know, with a, right. and, and here we are two records in and I've done everything I ever wanted to do. There is no, there's no way out of here, you know? Yeah. And that was for me the moment when Edge of Sanity kind of died as that thing. You know, I, I just mm. kind of, it climaxed then and there. And then, you know, I just remember okay let's start to write more songs then what we do now i don't know so we we got into it with like jesus christ which is pretty traditional remember the first song i actually wrote was lost and um then there you know okay maybe we can do some kind of thing here but but then it just all kind of it's like hmm i cannot do another unorthodox and i cannot not do another unorthodox, you know? And I thought up until the point the album was released that people were actually going to show up at my house and shoot me (laughs) because we put like Sisters of Mercy, rip-off song, Man of War covers, punk songs, whatever on that Spectral Sorrows. But then again, everybody loved it. Yeah. We sold shitloads. It was like the reviews were like, wow, wow, wow. We said, yeah, but what about unorthodox for fuck's sake? You know, <laughs> that's like the, the, the crowning achievement. Oh, you did other records? Like, oh, fuck, you know, <laughs> because we had proper distribution. You know, Blackmark was taking off. And for some reason, there was like guys that were just a little bit too young to be a part of that first year 
like 91, 92, they were old enough to jump on what was happening in 93 when the genre was more, you know, it was more out there. Bands had actually made it big within the scene. Like, you know, you had your Entombs, you have your Carcass, you know. It was expanded to the point it was not only some obscure tape trading yeah. underground thing. You could go to your local record shop and buy a death metal album or CD at right. the time. It's like the pressure's so, on. Yeah, and we were just at the right time there. But, but for me, that was just like, wow, people like this record. They are weird, you know. I thought it would have made a cool EP. But I was having to do it because we were, we were having a record contract and I was running a recording studio and I needed to make money. So we made sure we had songs and we did two weeks of recording and that was it, you know. So it was completely the opposite, the whole vibe about us against the world together in leather and spikes and blah, graveyards and, you know, late night phone calls. I've got the coolest fucking idea for a song, you know. None of that was for the Spectral Sorrows. So it felt so different. Like we had to do it. And weird enough, that's one of the favorite records for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's interesting uh, because you kind of talking about basically like pressure to uh, like a commitment. And, you know, everybody like wants to or, you know, it, it's just natural to like be like looking to that that achievement aspect, whatever that milestone is, how it feels, whatever, whatever. And then, you know, to then get it and then almost be on, like, you know, going through the motions then. It's like, man, this is a commitment. Like, that's where then, like, maybe the, I don't know, the the, the kind of the curse that it could almost be could, pre- to, could present itself. And I've always found it interesting because I can't really see it any other, other way where, like, I'm, like, for my music, like, I can, yeah, be kind of like n- nothing like you, but kind of like you where i can record it uh play you know numerous instruments and do different layers and and all that stuff that i've always felt that having that ability has helped me um achieve the like you said earlier like i can hear certain things in my head to its completion like i don't just hear the guitar riff i hear the reverb that should go on the vocals as well when i hear just that guitar riff even though that's what i'm working on at the time you know i can hear the full song so, to like, I've always felt like to have the ability to then, you know, be working through the process because it takes forever, um, then, and to then, you know, make sure it got the reverb and, and to be the full mold, that that was always, like, something that really uh, was valuable because then it's like, you know, now I can, A, see my idea full through, but then, B, it's like, it's, it's the studio, it, it allows you to experiment and get there because you don't have to be like sitting there like oh my god like it's we, we spent 10 minutes on this like you know it's 50 dollars an hour 10 minutes is what 10 bucks like you know you're just sitting there <laughs> you, you, you know what i mean like you you can't just even get into that creative space it's just like we just got to get this done because oh my god it's going to cost so much money where like if you have the ability and you don't have to pay some guy like you can be way more free and do some of this creative stuff that i can only imagine that at least from way i execute things or hear them and you know you know work in my mental state like and then here's a lot of the stuff that you've done it's like man i can't imagine like that has to have been something that you gotta at least somehow appreciate having the ability to be the engineer as well because it's like how would you have done that if you were just the guitar player that has to like rely on you know an engineer or something like that that you just be like yeah i mean like sitting there at the studio like oh my god like just pressure's on i, I would imagine or or no like i guess that's my question to you like the, do you feel like that the having the the jack of all trades really be it multi instruments to the guy in the studio that that has really been a, a key element to being able to do a lot of the experimentation that you have done through the years? Absolutely. I mean, it was, like I said earlier, it was always for me, like one thing, you know, I, I write a song, but I already knew how I wanted that, that kind of song to sound in the end. And it was pretty demoralizing the first time we went to Montezuma <laughs> because the first record sounded like ass. <laughs> and the second one, I was like, there is no way that boss is coming to the studio because he kind of destroyed the first one sonically and we don't need his presence or vibe. Just come here, pay our, you know, living space bill, whatever, pay the cello player and go home. And, uh, we brought all our own amps, my own drum kit. We brought all the stuff that we didn't do for the first album. And we just made sure that this time is going to fucking work. And even though unorthodox sounds pretty 
different than most other albums, especially the stuff coming out of Mars Sound around the same time. You can actually hear exactly what's going on at all times. You know, even though you have a lot, lot of intricate guitar arrangements and stuff, uh, you can even hear the bass, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And um, so that was that was the thing for me. And also around that time, I had um, already started recording demos for for local bands pretty pretty seriously i mean i've done a lot of stuff at that point and i just knew when i worked with drex for unorthodox um that i would not be coming back i would yeah. never set my foot in in a what you would say real studio ever again because i felt that it was alienating me a little bit from the music. I mm -hmm. could not just grab a knob and do shit. I right. didn't understand fuck shit about that big ass console with all this dual weird knobs. It's like, where's the treble? Oh, you have to first pull that one and select this. And I was like, fuck, I need a thing that say treble. And oh, we don't <laughs> have that. Okay. So, you know what I mean? It was like uh, so much choices and weird crashing computers that motorized this yep. and that. And some reverb that kept fucking up. You pull it yep. out of the rack and slam it back in. Oh, no, it's working again. You know? So I said, fuck, I want to be able to pull out the plug from channel eight and put it into yep. channel nine. No fucking Bantam patch base and whatever weird ass shit. And that was, of course, for me, I, I knew then that what I have is is cool. I thought things were different. Just, I mean, I imagined putting an, like an SM57 on my snare drum, recording it on one of the tracks on a two-inch 24-track tape would make it sound like the snare drum on Hysteria from Def Leppard. <laughs> but it sounded exactly like it did on my A-track. Huh. It was like no difference because <laughs> I mean when you when you when you know more about recording that the two inch versus like a quarter inch, they have eight track, they have twenty four. It's not that much of a difference. It's a few millimeters wider, you know, a little yeah. bit faster. Right. But it's not gonna do any magic. But I thought once we're in a twenty four track, everything's gonna sound just like magic. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you put the mic, it's gonna sound super. But I realized the hard way that's that's not the case. Sometimes right. shit sounded even worse than it did when I recorded it because I was closer to the source somehow. You know, it didn't have that recording room, mixing room. You could just like put put on a pair of headphones and just sit and move around the mic because the amp was down by your knees. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, that's the sweet spot. Let's record yeah. the rhythms, you know? Yeah, well, then yeah. it's also I, the limitations too, like trying to convey the message to somebody else. Like even though like, because then you got to work through their struggles of even getting what you might desire. And then they might f have some things that they like along the way that then you got to like be like, well, I don't like it. And then, you know, I mean, it, it depends the engineer you're working with because some people take it personally then and, and they want to combat that. Well, let's at least keep it in there. Or then you might have the engineer that just rolls off like oh okay fine he's the client i'll do whatever he wants to say <laughs> but like if you you know what i mean like if you hold those cards I'm, I'm sure you probably know exactly what i mean that that it's like you know like you don't have to convey and go through these shitty examples of the idea either you can just know how to get there yourself answer it only yourself like I, I can't imagine that there's you know all these crazy ideas and stuff that you've experimented through that if there was somebody else to maybe add their flavor to that 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 would have been as productive as you know what i mean in writing that stuff like it almost seems key that you got to have that that ability as well and it almost because it almost even seems like a, a, the uh like a lot of the musicians that have gone down that route also have like they, they they produce their own records and stuff like it, i mean it's it, it happens without it as well but it's also it seems to be like a common trait too um so i, I guess it's more so a, a remark on that uh but i i just yeah i, I definitely wanted to touch upon that because you know I, I could ask a zillion questions when it comes to recording and stuff right. but i was definitely <laughs> far more more interested in yeah when you uh you know hold the cards and kind of can be the guy running